Okay. All right. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning to everyone who's joined us. And uh, I'm going to go through a few housekeeping items while we wait for other people to join us. Um, right now, all of our panelists, uh, I'm sorry, our panelists, uh, you'll be hearing from in a moment, but all the other registrants are muted. At, we're going to be taking questions at the end of the presentation, but you can type your questions into the chat box at any point during the presentation. I'll also remind you again later on that you can do that. Um, we'll take once you type your questions into the chat box, we'll be reading them off at the end of the presentation. And if for some reason you don't see the chat box, you may need to look for the little orange arrow in the upper right of your screen. And uh, if you click on that, uh, the panel will come out and you can, you can type in your questions. We're also recording the webinar. So if you want to refer to any of the information, or if you know someone who is not able to attend the webinar in person, um, we will have it up on our website probably by, well, certainly by the end of the day tomorrow. We might even be able to get it up there today. So it won't be too long before we'll have the slides and the <coughs> webinar up on the website. So I'm going to... Um, go through a little bit about who SSTI is, and then I'll introduce our presenters. Uh, let's see. So if you're not already familiar with SSTI, we are a network of reform-minded DOTs. We were founded in 2010, and we are housed at the University of Wisconsin, and now a partnership with uh, Smart Growth America, which is in Washington, D.C. So we actually have two offices now. SSTI works in three different ways. We have an executive level community of practice where we get the CEOs of DOTs together about once a year. And I'll be saying a little bit more about one of those meetings in a few moments. We also do technical assistance for the states that are partnering with us, and you can see a map of who's currently coming to our meetings or places we're doing technical assistance. And we also are a resource for the larger transportation community. So we have a website with resources. We do these webinars. We have a newsletter that we put out with interesting ideas and work that states are doing and sometimes regions. And you can find all of that on our website, which is ssti.us. So today we are joined by uh, John Schroer, who is the commissioner of the Tennessee DOT, and Joe Galbato, who is the chief financial officer. One of, at our last community of practice meeting, which was in July, uh, one of the topics was about workforce development and retention. A lot of different state DOTs have trouble either attracting uh, staff or retaining them. And different states have different challenges depending on where they are. And um, it was, but it was a topic that they all were very interested in and they had a very lively discussion. Um, our COP meetings are um, very free, you know, discussion, not very formal. And they got a chance to chat amongst themselves about this issue. And one of the presenters was John and Joe, who we're going to hear about hear from today. And their presentation was so well received that we decided to do a webinar. So that is the context of our webinar today. Um, and again, for those who are just logging on, I do want to remind people that you can uh, we're going to take questions at the end. You can type all of your questions into the chat box, which should appear on the right of your screen if you click the little orange arrow. And then once we get to the end of the presentation, um, you will be taking the questions. So I am going to turn over uh, the controls to uh, John, and then he is going to introduce uh, Joe. 
So go ahead, John. You go ahead and take it away. Right. Okay, thanks. Hey, hey, everybody. Thank you all for listening. I am John Schroer and um, uh, muted. have been in this position uh, seven and a half years. And um, we, we have worked, all of us, I'm also president of AASHTO this year. And uh, one of the things we've talked a lot about was workforce development. It seems to be an issue uh, that every DOT, and not just DOTs, but departments across uh, all state governments are having having issues with. And um, we uh, we have we like everybody else do have those issues. But I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, kind of the progression that we've made, some of the things that we've done internally. Joe Gabato is my chief financial officer. He's also uh, the deputy commissioner and head of the administrative side, which is over, uh, among other things, but our HR department has a long line of uh, uh, financial background. This is not that, but uh, has done a great job kind of orchestrating this, um, this program that we've done, and it's kind of multifaceted. And I want to give you a little history, uh, kind of where we got to where we are, and then I'm going to turn it over to Joe to kind of get into the details. And, and my background uh, is not in the public sector, but in the private sector. I am uh, the governor asked me to come and head up this department uh, 11, or excuse me, seven and a half years ago in 2011. And I am a commercial real estate developer by trade. So I have uh, some history in the and the development of commercial properties. And while uh, somewhat different than the, the building of roads and bridges and running a DOT, a lot of the, lot of the things that we do here were the same things I did uh, running a commercial development company. And when, when I got here, the, the third weekend, uh, I was required to uh, present my budget to the state legislature, to the, I don't. I guess it was the first thing was the House Transportation Committee, and and I'm being taught and coached by a lot of TDOT employees because I really had no history at all with TDOT uh, before I joined joined this organization three weeks before I had to give my budget presentation, which at the time was uh, about a 2.5 billion dollar, uh, excuse me, 1.5, no, 1.8 billion dollar budget. Um, we're now up to about 2.1 billion. And one of, one of the things they kept telling me is that uh, you, you, we need to talk about how fewer employees we have this year than we had last year that we're gonna do in the upcoming budget. And that was kind of a big deal. And, and what I quickly learned that one of the scorecards that we were being judged by, both uh, by the House and, and the Senate, was the number of employees we had, and we needed to have less employees than we had the year before. That was a goal. That is also a goal of many, many, many state governments uh, across the country. And and so we did that. We we were doing what was right. We cut you know a couple hundred jobs or whatever the number is. And 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 as I delved into that um, and started talking, Joe came uh, right after our initial budget presentation the first one we had those conversations and and what uh and as we looked into it and looked into it we started seeing a pattern of uh, huge increases in in the usage of consultants uh that was directly proportional to the decrease of employees that we were out and what i quickly realized was that we were using consultants to replace employees and and in my position as ESCO, I, I see that happening all the time and talk to other <clears throat> CEOs like me. And a lot of states are really outsourcing everything that they do, everything from uh, con construction inspection to design to IT to lots of different things are being outsourced. And, and so we kind of did a deep dive into that and, and realized that in the consulting side, what we were doing, and I can give you a quick example, is that we would say we had a a, a, a design, a bridge designer that was making eighty thousand dollars a year, uh, and 
that designer decided to take a job to the private sector. And um, he would go to the private sector, and because the state really wasn't hiring new employees, and actually for a while, for a long while, we were under a hiring freeze, what we would do is we would turn around and hire the consultants, the company that that person got, went to work for, and then that person would come back and sit at his own desk where he was before at our DOT, but now was employed by a private consultant who were paying three or four times the cost uh, of that we paid this employee when he was a direct employee. And we, we started doing a lot of research in it, and, and at one point in time we had over a hundred employees or people working in our department that were not truly employees, that they worked for somebody else. And the cost of that uh, just got to be ridiculous. So I went to the governor uh, and, and we tied this into a thing called uh, top to bottom review, which the governor asked us to do. And I tried to explain to him why that wasn't a sound practice. And so uh, we started working through that, came through some ideas and, um, that's kind of about where where we got started. And so I'm gonna turn it over to Joe uh, to kind of take the next step, and then we'll be happy to answer questions uh, later on. But uh, thank you all for, for tuning in, and uh, <coughs> hope you can get something out of this presentation. All right, thank you, Commissioner. Again, as you said, this is Joe Galvato. I am the Chief Financial Officer at TDOT. So basically what Commissioner is saying here we don't believe in Tennessee that the gauge of efficiency is just number of headcount. And so we've been able to demonstrate that to the legislature as well as the governor's office. And so we'll embark on this presentation. The theme really here is that there's, there's really not a sprint here. It's a long run. It's a long-term change in how you do business. And so let's talk about first uh, on this first slide. Go back to that first slide. So this is the environment that Commission and I uh, uh, inherited in 2011-2012. So as he mentioned, there was a pre previous hiring freeze. As you can see in bullet number three, they were very successful. Uh, the intended consequence was to drop headcount. Well, they did drop it from 4,500 people down to 3,700. <clears throat> the unintended consequences that had us far from that were that they severely hurt our core competencies. As the commissioner mentioned, you had designers and engineers and financial people and IT people leaving and not being able to be replaced. So we cut our core competencies. In addition to core competencies getting cut, uh, we had a severe morale problem. So you had people trying to do one and two different jobs and moving their their time back and forth, it wasn't very efficient. We started looking at our op techs, the operation technicians. These are our entry level employees in the operation side. These are the people fighting snow and ice, the people picking up litter, doing uh, spot patching, all of that. These folks, when we came into office, they were only making about $18,000 a year. So as you can imagine, $18,000 a year in America <clears throat> is not getting people very far. And so we had a lot of turnover, uh, in fact, when we analyzed the number of people who would start with TDOT in a year and leave within a year, 75% were our op techs. So that was a problem. So we just talked about bullet point number three. So yes, we cut our headcount, but look what happened to consulting of $56 million in just five years. And so it's exactly as the commissioner said. So we were replacing our normal labor with high price consulting labor, which again is not um, not an appropriate way to run a business. Uh, we started looking at uh, salaries, you know, whether they're managers, directors, whatnot. Our director salaries are all over the board. It didn't really matter whether you were managing a small division or a large division. The disparity in salaries could be twenty-five to thirty thousand dollars a year. And as I mentioned previously, turnover was bleak. We were hanging at about the fourteen to fifteen percent range. So, question is: So we looked at each other and said, "So, what do you do?" So in the private sector, the first thing you do, which is often um, a big folly, is you quickly raise salaries and you do that. Well, in government, you couldn't do that. So they started doing other things. So you do one-time team building events and try to get people interested in their jobs again, but they were just that. They were short-term little fixes that weren't helping people. And then something that TDOT did do that we had to uh, uh, 
uh, disconnects later on, giving promotions to people that really, uh, just to keep them around. So you have a really good financial accountant, um, and let's make, make he or she a manager. We have a really good engineer, let's make he or she a manager. And they weren't managers, and so we had poor management, people leaving. So I think the point of this whole thing is history will show that there's no really quick fixes in this whole thing, and you have to take a long-term approach, and so that is what we did. The long-term approach essentially started uh, right from the top with our governor. So when the governor came into office, he had two big initiatives, the top to bottom initiative, as well as asking all of the commissioners, getting suggestions, how could they, what could he do to make uh, government run better? And so we, in Tennessee, we have approximately 20 commissioners statewide, and there were literally a couple hundred different suggestions on what to do. Our commissioner had one suggestion. And so they came back to him and they said, well, you know, uh, your brethren have got five, ten each. Wouldn't you like to do something more and, and have some other ideas? And he said, no. He said, if I can hire, I can fire, I can promote, I can pay people appropriately, I can do my job and state government will be better. Thus, the genesis of the TEAM Act. The TEAM Act is the acronym for the Tennessee Excellence, Accountability, and Management Act. It was met with a lot of discussion, obviously, with the, the employee union and legislators. But when all came, when it all came down to is we basically abolished what we call career service, which was our civil service, and made hiring, firing, promoting, uh, working with employees based on job performance, not just on longevity. In addition to this whole team act, allowing us to be a little more agile organization, they did a big study with Mercer. And what the whole idea was is that government understands that we cannot bring our wages to be dead even with the private sector. That's not gonna happen. But it was a way to move them closer to that so we could pay people, pay people, pay people closer to market. And to put his money where his mouth was, the, the governor actually instituted several across the board pay increases. So I want to talk about CDOT's path in two specific areas. This first one will be IT, the second will be in our operations side. On the IT side, when we came into office, there were 100 people in IT, about 70 were employees, about 30 were contractors. Today we still have about 90 to 100, but very few contractors. We brought people on as full-time employees. We've got people excited about coming here by uh, embracing the Agile methodology. As most of you will know, uh, government is notorious for developing IT projects over the course of many months and many years. We come up with a very thick manual of all the things we want here in August of 2018. When it's delivered in August of 19, all of our needs have changed. They've worked for a year and it's, it's completely worthless. The Agile methodology allows people to work in two-week sprints such that we, you can see what progress you're making and also keep double checking with the, the uh, stakeholders in the business to make sure we are giving them what they want at the end. We're also enticing people in IT by comparing the internal versus the shared service model. Again, many uh, IT departments across the nation are being consolidated into a shared service model. Well, the whole shared service model is based on leverage leveraging lots of IT people to work in different places. Well, we were able to convince people that, well, one, transportation is a pretty unique industry that you can't really take an IT person from the Department of Health or from TenCare and have them start to understand what's going on with the Traffic Management Center. Um, also, with our 100 people in TDOT, we have way more than 100 man years of work to do in, a, in the course of the year. So we were going to be able to leverage IT people to help the Department of Health and the Department of Human Resources. And so we've been autonomous up to now and we believe we're going to be able to, to stay that way. We have been doing cutting edge development. So our programmers and developers have done things for our traffic management center. There's something we call SWIFT that once some of the consultants understood what we did and how we did it, they tried very hard to hire away our developers of that. We've also embraced another thing that is enticing to our IT folks is the AWS, Alternative Workplace Solutions. So what this does is rather than in the IT world having a giant cube farm and offices for all of the supervisors, <clears throat> we have lots of spaces. We have shared spaces. 
We have big bullpen areas where four, five, and six developers will collaborate for many days on end, and then they go to individuals' places for quiet time and to develop what they have to do on their own. And then there's other shared and pre-addressed spaces. That, is been, that has been very um, key to uh, attracting other IT professionals. So all these things have made IT and TDOT kind of a cool place to work, and for that, we're pretty excited. Going to the construction maintenance, so you have the, um, the construction side that is usually very busy, obviously, in the summer, constructing stuff. Maintenance was busy in the summer, but really busy in the winter, fighting snow and ice. What this initiative does is brings together these two units to make one cohesive unit. So they're busy all year versus parts of the year. The biggest help has been them fighting snow and ice. So to put this, uh, the legwork to put all this in place are the next three bullet points. We had to revise job titles, classes, qualifications. We are going to increase our staff from 1,800 operations people to about 2,200 positions. Through that, we got 1,500 employee responses through surveys, finding out what they like, what they disliked about their job, um, and then we conducted face-to-face -face interviews, but not just with employees. We talked to FHWA, our, our people here in Tennessee, contractors, prime contractors, MPOs. So once we laid the groundwork for the structure, we had to implement it. So we did, just as we have on this page. We had to increase the job requirements. What that actually meant was for our maintenance people who didn't really need a degree to come in to work for TDOT, they needed to get their GEDs because they were going to have to do some different inspections, some different calculations that if they didn't have a GED or a high school diploma, they wouldn't be able to do. We aided them in doing this. We had several, several of these employees who didn't have it. They decided to retire, and that was fine. But we paid to have people train and mentor in the regions. 173 employees received their GEDs. And the uh, commissioner could tell you chapter and verse when they came to Nashville for their graduation ceremony. There wasn't a dry eye in the house, and the governor actually attended. On the construction side, we made them get a CDL because it's fine that they're doing inspections through the summer, but you know, in the wintertime, we need people to jump in the trucks and push snow and ice. And so that required them to do that. Then we realized that the Mercer study was good, but the Mercer study, in our opinion, did not go far enough on the operation side. So we started to look outside. So we looked to Nashville. We looked at Memphis. We looked at Chattanooga, Knoxville, our four major cities here in Tennessee, to look at what were pay practices, what were job titles and whatnot, to try to get something that was more equivalent, much more competitive. And then we put those adjustments in place. We'll get to how this all pulls together here at the end and then our summation. Uh, recruitment is a big thing for us. So our college visits, as all DOTs do, we recruit engineers, that's what we do. But DOTs are not just an engineering place. We have IT folks, we have finance folks, we have HR folks, we have planners, we have environmental people. So we're going after all those disciplines and we were routinely going out to colleges, primarily in the southeastern region. Um, GTAs, those are our graduate, those are our engineers, our, our bachelors of engineering. We have hired 258 of those in the last five years. Our internship program is actually a new program where we're hiring about 60 students each summer to work with us. Again, they're not just engineers, they're in all of our disciplines from engineering to environment to finance. It should be noted that of these interns, we've had 32 that have uh, returned to us to be hired. And several of these interns have actually come back summer after summer. So we get a good look at them, they get a good look at us, and we're able to offer them jobs. Another giant uh, recruitment tool that we've got is our rapid hire program. This is basically for the entry level positions, our op tech technicians, the folks on the road, where we're hiring 30, 40, 50 at a time. In a two-day period, we can have them fill out the application, do the interview, and extend a job offer. <clears throat> and obviously, as long as they pass their drug test, we can have them employed in the next two weeks, which in the, uh, our history so far, we've hired 450 of these folks. So once you get people on, on site, 
It's all about continuing education and job enrichment. We believe that this continuing education and job enrichment helps with the retention. And it's not just at one level. We've gone from the top of the organization to the bottom, as you can see on this page. And our senior management, we've taken our senior folks through lots of time management seminars so that they kind of understand how to budget their time better. Negotiation skills, how to basically not give out the store when you first have your first offer. And generational training, you know, really trying to understand the millennials, understanding that, you know, that millennial who walks through your door today will work their tail off, but they really don't like downtime, and so you better make sure that they're busy and that they've got stuff to do all the time. That's been invaluable for our senior leaders. We have our online civil engineering master's program. It's offered through the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, and it allows our guys to go online and earn their master's degree in civil engineering. Now, depending on the number of courses they want to take, it can take them two to four years. The only thing we ask in return <clears throat> is twice the time. So if it takes them two times, two years to get their uh, master's, we require them to stay with us for four years. And thus far, uh, no one has, has left us. The Fundamentals of Engineering FE Review Program is self-explanatory. The ReConnect Certificate is something the Commissioner is very proud of. We basically got a program, it's for operations staff. It's an 18 month program where they learn some basics of business. They learn things like computer skills, math skills, and obviously other construction skills, welding and whatnot. At the end of those 18 months, they get an automatic 5% raise in pay. But what's most important to us, especially the commissioner, is that we have articulation agreements in place with several universities and community colleges in Tennessee that that certificate parlays to 12 to 15 credit hours toward their degree. Hopefully they, and the whole idea is hopefully they will work their way toward an associate's degree and a master's, a bachelor's degree, master's, et cetera. The whole idea that the commissioner has fostered is lifelong learners. The minerals technology certificate is the same basic thing except for our materials test folks. And the LITMOS, that's our learning management system where we can track online the safety, supervisory technical training that people are required to get, and um, it's been a pretty good system. A couple other things that we've done that just are kind of unique, we have partnered with our prime contractors here in Tennessee and the Department of Corrections for a three-month inmate training program. And what this entails, it doesn't really help TDOT, but it helps TDOT's prime contractors. We choose a, a small class of inmates that I'm sure they're on good, on good behavior and toward the end of their, uh, their sentence ready for parole. They spend two months in the classroom learning about construction, learning about what that prime contractor does in the field, whether it's hauling gravel, flagging, whatever. And then they actually have one month out on the site like a real worker getting paid. And then at the end of that three months, and then once they reach their parole, all these folks in our first class, it was a small class of 12, all will offer jobs and all will start with prime contractors. We're working very high, hard on our succession planning. TDOT, Tennessee is not unique. Today, about 25% of our people could walk out the door today and retire. In five years, it'd be about 40%. So we're being very diligent, documenting processes and procedures, but also using this as a job enrichment thing where we can have the younger folks cross-train and have a more broader reach on that job. So what are the results? So this is what we're most proud of. As you can see, in 2007, we had 4,500 employees. Through the job freezes, the, the uh, hiring freeze, they did. They dropped down to 3,700 employees, but balloon consulting, as we mentioned before. But look what we've done. We've hired back 200 people and cut our consulting $54 million. Now, to be perfectly frank, so that's not all savings the bottom line. Once you factor in the people that we've hired, it's $42 million of savings, which is still very, very strong, allows us to do several different projects that we couldn't do before, and our turnover has dropped from 14 to 10%. So on our OPTEC, so after we did the Mercer study and after we looked at other metro areas, we've been able to raise the minimum pay uh, from 18 to 31. So what this has done, uh, this has actually got obviously people much more excited about working. They don't have to work a second job. In fact, the commissioner has received several calls from people saying 
the first thing I'm going to do is go and call whoever I work for at night and stop at and go to my kids' baseball games. We have operations staff returning who had left before because they couldn't make a livable wage, but they're coming back. We have 40 more engineering people on staff, uh, engineers, and as far as that reconnect program where the people got 5% and on their way to college, we have 100 graduates at this point. So with that, that's our presentation, and um, I guess we can probably just take questions from whoever wants to ask. Unmuted. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, that was a wonderful presentation. I was taking notes myself. Um, and anyone who's on the line, I do want to remind you that you can type in questions into the chat box. Uh, if you don't see the chat box, you can um, you can uh, pull on the little orange arrow and uh, it should appear and then we can take questions. Um, let's see. Okay, so we do have one person asking about minorities, disadvantaged groups, or DBE, doing business as. Um, that wasn't included in the presentation, and uh, just asking if you wanted to say anything about that. Well, sure. I mean, our focus is always on uh, parity, and so we have our statistics as far as minorities and females. Um, and so, I mean, so we, we are trying to hire the most qualified people we can. On our DBE program, we actually have a very strong DBE program. In fact, uh, we're one of the first ones in the nation now to try to get DBE goals on consulting contracts, and we are just putting that um, on in our next letter. So um, we're very focused on all of that. Okay. Uh, we do have somebody asking about um, the recording for the webinar. Uh, we will have both the slides and the webinar up on our website, likely by the end of the day. If not today, then definitely we will have it up tomorrow. And everyone who's on the webinar will get a, a, a reminder with a link to the webinar. So if you want to reference any of this this information or if you know somebody who wasn't able to attend we'll have that up on the website um, so let's see what is the con constant construction cost for the years that you've quoted I mean so you talked about consultants you talked about the number of employees but do you have numbers for the constant construction costs yeah this is the question uh, you know those numbers were really based upon some stable construction dollars at that at, during that period of time from 2011 to 2017 uh, we uh, our budget remained uh, pretty much the same uh, the, we were in the 2.5 to 2.8 billion dollars uh, worth of construction uh, under under contract we, we would let uh, right at a billion dollars a year um, in new contracts. Now we have subsequent to that uh, in 2017, um, maybe it was 16, 2017 uh, passed the Improve Act, which uh, gave us an additional $250 million a year uh, in, in funding in our department. So the last, uh, this last year, we increased uh, our lettings up to about $1.2 billion a year and uh, that should increase up to about 1.3 in the next couple of years. So, uh, but those numbers that, you, that we showed are on a very comparable construction budget year to year. Great. Uh, so we also have a question here about how did you decide what roles or capabilities should be transferred from consulting staff to internal staff and which should remain as consulting staff? Well, I, I guess we looked at the different needs. So we tried to get some low-hanging fruit first. There were certain tasks that consultants were doing that we just felt that it was much more economical to have our people do it. We always feel like we're going to have consultants, and that's something we had to talk to our consulting partners about, that you know, there's always going to be a need. But as I mentioned, uh, actually, I didn't mention before, I, I come from healthcare, And so in healthcare, you know, the first thing you do is you look at a certain staffing 
and then you utilize consultants or agency labor when you have peaks or you have certain jobs that that require certain expertise. Transportation is no different. We need to staff at a level where we can do our basic jobs, our basic designs, but when it comes to more complicated designs or more complicated construction, or we just have, as the commissioner just mentioned with the IMPROVE Act, getting a, a bunch of extra work going through, that we handle those peaks and valley, the peaks with the consultants. So that's our approach. Yeah, and, and we started with the, our CEI inspection group uh, the, the most, I think. That was an uh, important part. And then we've moved into other areas. But I think, and Joe mentioned core competencies, and, and I, that's a critical issue uh, with uh, state DOTs. And if you talk to consultants along the way, that, you know, they're happy to work with departments who have really top quality people working for those departments. That it is hard for them to deal with, I hate to say the word, incompetent people within uh, within DOTs. And so we've really reached a, a, a kind of a happy uh, position where we really feel comfortable with the quality of workers that we have. We've been able to raise salaries, attract some, a lot of people from the private sector. And so our relationships with our consultants are, are very good. The quality of workers that we have make a big difference in the quality of work that we produce. Uh, and, and in the meantime, there's also cost savings in the construction side, uh, dealing with contractors who also know that our people are top-notch quality. They can, they can have a better control of their projects. They understand construction better. Uh, they're better trained, and therefore uh, we can uh, – we can call into question, I think, more legitimately things that contractors try to, to uh, put over on us, uh, as they sometimes do. And I think all in all, uh, we, we're at a good equilibrium between uh, outside uh, workers and, and our uh, in-house workers. Yeah, we feel that way. And we feel like, you know, as Commissioner mentioned, so our CEI, we've cut it about in half. And then we've actually dropped our environmental uh, consultants as well down to where we think is a, is a normal level of, of working. Okay, great. Um, we do have uh, one other question, unless somebody uh, wants to type in another one. Um, someone asked, uh, if you could please discuss the team of experts that you put together to assess the talent gaps and how to address those gaps. Beyond Mercer, did you use any other consultants? Uh, I mean, we basically use our staff, I and mean, we have we used our our top engineers along with our HR staff. We've got an incredible HR department here, um, led by a gal from Vanderbilt. Um, so yes, they I mean they talked about all the different attributes they needed, and um, but we really didn't engage anyone other than Mercy. Yeah, and and you know uh, if you our, our directors, you know I've got uh, 43 or four directors. Uh, that have a pretty good understanding of their jobs and then all of the people important. If, if you're in a department that uh, is shorthanded uh, and you're hiring consultants and stuff, we, we did a lot of interviews with, with uh, those people in, in different uh, committees that we formed to try to learn exactly what their needs were. So it was easy for them to say, you know, I need I need a, an appraiser, I need a designer, I need a bridge designer, I need this for spending way too much money for, you know, on consultants over this. I know I can save money. Everyone was, was uh, everyone uh, kind of bought into this uh, pretty easily. I mean, it, they could see where the department uh, could, could benefit themselves, they could improve the department, they could improve the quality of workers that they had. And so there was, it was kind of, all over the whole department. There wasn't, you know, just one division that did something. We kind of did it uh, kind of uh, off the carte blanche all the way over and everybody bought into it and uh, have our, and, and that in and of itself has really helped the, the, uh, the attitudes of employers and the employees. If, you know, if you're working in a department that, that hires good people and, you're not overworked and underpaid. You you like your job better. You're less likely to leave. Uh, you're also more likely to encourage other people that you know to come to work for for this department. And so, as you can see, we've re reduced our turnover rate from about 14 to 10. 
you know, we'd like to get it down a little bit more, but a little turnover is always healthy. And uh, so we're, we're pleased about where we are at this point in time. Okay. And then uh, we had sort of maybe perhaps a follow-up question on that. Uh, was there any communication to internal or external stakeholders about the need for change? Did you get any resistance? Um, you know, sort of, I guess, how did you message that? And yeah. how did people react yeah, so, to it? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I can tell you that, that, the, that I had a lot of visitors from consultants, visits from consultants during that time period. Um, and the governor got a whole lot of phone calls from consultants saying, you know, we supported you and now you're crazy. Commissioner of Transportation is cutting our jobs and this, that, and the other. So uh, he was very supportive of that because he, uh, our governor is also came from the private sector, owns a very large company, understands uh, how, what, what, a, what a bottom line looks like. Uh, he, he listened to our proposal, made perfectly good sense to him. And so he was very supportive. You know, in the, in the, in the consultant uh, business, I kind of threw it back to them. And, and I said, you know, what, you're trying to tell me to run state government totally different than the way you would run your own company. You, you hire at a certain level and you keep that staff consistent. And if you need a specialty person, if you, if you got a design project and there's some seismic issues, you, you will go hire a company that specializes in seismic issues. You don't keep a seismic staff uh, on board. And, and, and we just, we show constant um, situations where that's how a good company is run. And then, and then I would say, so you don't want me to run my department the way you would run your own company. And, you know, it's pretty hard to argue that. And, and most of them would say, well, yes, but, then they would say, well, you can't run state government like you run a private business. And I said, oh, yes, you can. And you do it by doing the things that we're doing. And, um, you know, I will tell you that at this point in time, uh, we don't get many complaints. The, the other thing that we did do on hiring consultants is that we started um, making sure that the consultants that we hired were the best consultants available, as we should always do. FHWA requires you to do that. But we didn't necessarily just spread the work out to everybody. We we made sure that the good the good quality uh, consultants are the ones that got the most work. And then because of that, uh, we got the best work out of them. And it really is a win win for us. So uh, it took about a a, a year or two uh, to kind of ease uh, into this. And uh, uh, right now, uh, everybody's pretty. Pretty much on the private side has bought into our program, and they've seen the seen the success of it, both from their relationships with the with the uh, department and the fact that we're saving money. And saving money means more work for them. If I save forty million dollars a year in consultant expenditures, that means that's forty million dollars of product of projects I can build. And so there's a there's a reward at the end of the line for that for everybody. Okay. Now, at the beginning of your presentation, you talked a little bit about pressure from the legislature to cut staff, and, and then you just talked a little about um, conversations with the governor and after making some changes. And someone actually asked, um, how has all this work helped, or has all this work helped to make conversations with your politicians easier? So are you having less battles about staffing or funding or who gets hired? Yeah, uh, well, I mean, we don't. We they well, they don't have any impact on uh, who gets hired. We we flat don't let that happen. We get calls all the time from legislators. I've got you know my my cousin Harry needs a job, and and we we just have a a flat answer that we'll be happy to interview your cousin Harry, but we will hire the best employee no matter what, no matter who you are, no matter what position you hold we will hire the best employee for our department. And we hold firm to that. We don't ever back off of that. Um, we have got a, a relatively good relationship with, the, with, the, with our legislators. Uh, we have the fortune of, we don't receive any general fund dollars at all. 
Uh, our money is uh, directly comes from you know fuel taxes and uh, vehicle registration fees and uh, a few other sources, but it's it's all it's all fixed. Uh, and so we don't we don't go to the general assembly during budget time and ask for money. We go to the general assembly and say this is how much money uh, our revenue department says we're going to have this year, and then we say this is how we're going to spend it. We also don't allow um, our legislators to pick projects. Uh, they, they, uh, we, we have projects that are uh, as part of our uh, fiscal budget, uh, but there's no line item change in that. They either approve the budget or don't. So all that has really helped, and, and so we don't get a lot of interference uh, from the legislature. No, and when and when they have seen the numbers, when you're you're, you're cutting 50 million a year in expense and putting you know the net of that the 42 million as i said toward other projects that's 40 million more that we would have had had we not made those those changes uh, they're very appreciative of that because chances are one of those projects are coming to some of their districts so and and uh, i do have to say for those of you that aren't we are a right to work state and so we don't have state employee unions we have a state um kind of employee i don't know what you call it necessarily but it that it, it has very little influence uh and it's not organized yes, and so it, yes non-union is the state the tennessee state employees association but we yes we so you can voluntarily belong to that but they have very little political influence so so by changing in in the team act by uh, kind of how we do that with other things it's important to note that every single state employee is now under a individual performance plan, and we now pay uh, on performance. And uh, we have uh, instituted that in the last two years. The governor usually puts out a percentage for employees uh, that that have a uh, out of five have a three rating of or above. They get a two percent pay raise, and then he puts a chunk of money in for performance pay raises. And uh, that has worked very well. We we did every employee, every single employee is under performance pay, uh, and uh, it has been very successful as well. Okay, um, and then somebody had a question about um, if there are any plans to continue adjusting compensation or total rewards, and also have you developed any public-private partnerships to continue training and developing the workforce? Well, uh, as far as uh, the second question, I mean, public-private partnerships. When well, we don't, we don't do public-private partnerships here in Tennessee. Now, as far as training the workforce, I mean, we we do engage outside uh, folks to help train. You know, we have some of the u local universities help us do our training. So, if but I, I don't, we don't call it a public-private partnership. To us, it's just we execute a contract with that university, and they they do the the teaching. Um, what was the first part of the question? Uh, the first part was whether you had any plans to continue adjusting the compensation or total rewards program. Well, yeah, so we, we're, we're constantly looking. Uh, I'm assuming there's going to be another Mercer type survey coming once we have a new administration. That will probably happen. But here at TDOT, we're constantly looking to see is there is there some disparity um, in that faction, whether it's in the operations side or whether it's in engineering or environment, looking, you know, are, are we having, is it hard to fill positions in, you know, that division, in the IT division? And if that's so, then we can go for a special request of our, our Department of Human Resources to say we really need to consider something here. And, so, it, and it all goes back to really the math and the bottom line. Uh, if we can convince the governor uh, that you know, paying a, a salary that maybe is is higher than what uh, another employee gets in IT or whatever whatever that is, if we can show to him that uh, there's a there's a reward to hire in house instead of uh, instead of going on a consultant uh, outsourcing a job. We can show that the bottom line is still positive. He's pretty open to that. And so um, we hopefully we will continue that uh, through the next administration. 
and uh, can continue to keep uh, competitive. You know, it's really great to be able to have uh, a, a cross movement of public and private employees within the state DOT. They they learn from each other, uh, they understand each other better, they work better together, and we're a better department because we're getting more people from the private sector to come to work for us. Uh, and, and we hope that continues. It, it is not really healthy if you look across the board for state DOTs to basically have only uh, people that have worked for the state and nobody else. And so oftentimes you'll see people who put their 30 years in for the state government and then go to the private sector and then come back and you know try to get work from a DOT and they understand how we work. Uh, but now we're doing it in both directions and it does make it a lot better and we have better relationships because of that. Okay. And, and Commissioner's, Commissioner's example is, is a perfect one. So once we did this, the Mercer survey, um, when they looked across state government on IT professionals, you know, the, the vacancy rate here, in, at least in, in Tennessee, is certainly metropolitan Nashville, really low on IT professionals. So they went ahead and overhauled all of the IT positions, um, and, and I think the state's very proactive, uh, at least thus far, we've had that. Okay, and uh, we're just going to make this one the last question. Um, and before we go on to it, I just want to thank everybody. I want to thank the um, commissioner and Joe for uh, providing such an informative webinar. And also, I want to uh, remind people that if you'd like to subscribe to our newsletter or follow us on Twitter or access any of our resources or or uh, reports or news articles or past webinars, uh, you can get that on our website, which is ssti.us. Uh, so the last question is about uh, the comparison of the department employees versus consultants, and it's sort of a cost issue. So what's the percentage cost of producing plans and providing construction engineering for the department versus consulting? And what's the comparison in cost overruns for department plans uh, compared to consultants? I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure we have tracked that uh, indirectly. In I, I, I will tell you that uh, we we're delivering uh, our percentage of projects to be being delivered on on uh, on budget is about 94 93%. So we do we do track that number and we track uh time of delivery. Uh I, I really think that the quality of work that we're getting out of our employees is as good as the quality of work we're getting out of consultants. And and again, that's because we've got we got both uh, organizations working together and everybody's learning and and we're able to, to get uh, a, a, a better uh, workforce you know what what also would happen historically uh, when we were under a hiring freeze and a, and a salary freeze is when the consultants would come and hire our employees they would hire our best ones they would not hire our bad ones and so the good ones would leave make more money and the not so good ones would stay, which meant the quality of our workforce was deteriorating rapidly. And I would say in that case, the work that we were doing uh, in-house was not good, but we've been able to, to uh, override that by hiring better people because quite frankly, we can pay more. And, and that's the argument in the, in the discussion that you'll end up having with legislators. And you have to have a governor that's supportive of that. And in order to, be, to get them supportive, you've got to show them the facts. And uh, we've been able to do that. And it has, I think the proof is in the pudding. Uh, we're happy with, uh, with the quality of work that we produce. Uh, and we, we don't have any, I, I would say just, and this is not a, um, you know, it's more anecdotal than anything else, but we, we don't have any more uh, issues with self-produced structural or road construction plans than we, than we do with, uh, with those from the private sector. Uh, I, I'd say we're on an equal par with them. Yeah, I mean, when you look at our statistics, our you know, percentage overages on projects is always in you know, under 10% all the time. Many, many times, right around 5%. So we're very, very acceptable in our realm. And as far as time, which is one of the most important things, 
we if if we extend a, a date for a real reason, then then there was a real reason for it. And again, where most of our projects are completed on time or via a, a extended time that really was appropriate. So as far as time and money, we feel like we're we're delivering the program the way it's supposed to be delivered. Okay. Well, thank you very much. You've gotten several compliments from people who attended. Uh, they said it was very useful and uh, that it's uh, great information. So thank you to uh, the commissioner and to Joe, and thank you to everyone who attended. Um, we'll have that recording and the slides from the webinar up on our website as soon as we can. Probably today, um, definitely by tomorrow. Thanks, everybody, for uh, joining us today. Bye-bye.